Welcome to Studies with Stearman. Join us as we look deeper into the Bible. Strengthen your faith with us, even as we see the day approaching. And now, here's Gary. Looking at Hebrews, Hebrews is not written to us as Christians, which may sound kind of funny, but it's actually to the Hebrews. That's what it says. It's a very serious appeal to the Hebrew mentality to understand what Christ has done. As Christians today, and as Bible-believing Christians, we understand the gospel of grace, we understand the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit, we understand that God has a particular plan, that He's doing something in the era in which we live that is different from anything He ever did in past eras. And Hebrews is a book written to the Hebrews about the superiority of Christ over the Old Testament prophets. And that's the way it opens in chapter 1. And then it goes on to talk about the superiority of Christ over the angels, angelic ministry. And then it goes on to say that Christ is superior to Moses. In an introductory set of remarks, it talks about why Christ is superior to Moses, his person, his commission through the Aaronic priesthood. And then as you go on, and this is where we're going to go today, starting in about chapter 4, we're going to begin to talk about the superiority of Christ's priesthood. Now, we know this. That is to say, any of us who've studied the Bible understand all of this. But it's really, I think, educational. Let's put it this way. It's a blessing for us to listen in on this private conversation between the writer to Hebrews and the leaders of the Hebrew priesthood. As we left off last week in chapter 3, verse 14, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. And I want to emphasize the word partaker because it's a very important word in Hebrews. Partaker, metokos, or metokoi in the plural. Partakers are partners. To say that you are a partner with Christ doesn't necessarily mean you're saved. In the case of the Hebrew priesthood, as this letter was written in about A.D. 68, before the temple was destroyed, the priesthood was still in full operation. And many, many, many of the people who are operating the temple, priests, acolytes, servants of various kinds, were quite convinced that Jesus was a very special person. In fact, they were convinced right up to the edge that He was the Messiah. But they had a problem because their temple was still in operation. In a way, the conditions of Hebrews cannot be duplicated today. It's a one-time deal. Writing in A.D. 68 to a group of people who were partakers, that is partners with Christ, and you can be a partner without necessarily being, being saved. That is to say, you can, at that time you could, in the temple, when literally thousands of people employed in temple worship had one foot in the temple and one foot in the work of Christ, and they were vacillating. And this whole letter is about uh, someone who is in that condition, someone who is in that position, uh, thinks, you know, I can maintain the work of the priesthood and I can maintain a walk with, with Christ. And, but to do so, you have to engage in mental gymnastics in which you make priestly worship the same as uh, being a priest in Christ, which is what we are. We are a nation and a kingdom of priests. Every believer is a priest through Christ. And if you want to study that, go back to Romans. And, and so there's a kind of a dilemma going on here, and we're watching 
the Lord put, put this book in the Bible so that we could watch this, this tug of war inside of, of the Hebrew mind and soul and spirit uh, between giving one's life fully to Jesus or returning to various aspects of the law. Now again, this letter was written 68 AD, uh, approximately 40, or approaching 40 years after the crucifixion of Christ. And as chapter 3 ends, uh, in 315 it says, While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, for some, when they heard, did provoke. They rebelled. And of course, we know all about the, the rebellion of the children of Israel. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt uh, came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And we mentioned last week that Here's a 40-year period of testing. All through the Bible, when you see the number 40, it's always associated with testing. Uh, I study the numerics of the Bible. Not numerology, numerics. And it's very obvious that numbers of things in the Bible are connected numerically. God has a system of understanding that uses numbers. Number seven is the most obvious. But there are, and number three is the number of the Godhead and so forth, but, but you find this all the way through the Bible. Forty happens to be the number associated with testing in a number of different places in the Bible. And I believe that's also true of the period between Christ's crucifixion and the destruction of the temple, which was, which was 40 years, from A.D. 30 to A.D. 70. And the writer to the Hebrews is writing about two years before the temple was destroyed, <clears throat> and he's saying, don't put your faith in this process, this uh, Levitical process, because it's about to be destroyed. And he actually, and we'll find this out as we proceed through Hebrews, if you know how to read Hebrews, he's actually warning that the temple is going to be destroyed. So, I want to say one other thing before we continue on. And that is that... The Bible is very carefully assembled. Uh, in a miraculous way. How many books are there in the Old Testament? 39 books. Well, that's not always, that has not always been true. Uh, it, when, when the books of the Old Testament were, were first bound as a series of scrolls, they were bound as 22 scrolls, one for each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Later on, uh, the Tanakh was rearranged in 39 books. And so 22, which is God's perfect number of the Hebrew alphabet, was changed to 39, the number of stripes. 40 stripes save one. And so the number of the books in the Old Testament was rearranged to suit that which was happening to God's people. Likewise, the New Testament contains 27 books. Now, most people just say Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Corinthians, blah, 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 Revelation. And those are the books of the New Testament. But if you study those books, they're put together in a very special way, in three groups of nine. Matthew through Galatians, you have nine books. And Matthew, of course, is the book of the king. Mark is the book of the man. Luke is the, uh, the book of, uh, of Jesus and his humanity. John is the book of uh, Jesus and his deity. Acts is the birthday of the church. Romans talks about justification, sanctification, glorification. First and second Corinthians talk about trouble in the church and how to fix it. Galatians talks about grace. And so the first nine books of the Bible start with the coming of Jesus and end up with, a, with Paul's you know, double-barreled assault on those who would uh, try to put the church under law. And the next nine books, 
Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon are the epistles of Paul that talk about the body of Christ. They talk about the emptying of Christ and his refilling again as he, as he entered the heavens. They talk about the effectiveness of the cross. They talk about prophecy, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. 1st and 2nd Timothy talk about church order. Titus talks about the gospel being sent to difficult places where people aren't necessarily going to want to receive the gospel. Philemon, which we studied before Hebrews, talks about going home to the Father. So you have the middle nine books of the Bible, Pauline epistles, that deal with the birthday of the church and going home to the Father. The coming of the church and the leaving of the church. The middle nine books of the New Testament. The last nine books of the, of the New Testament, Hebrews through Revelation, and we're in Hebrews now, take another turn. Suddenly, you know, just almost amazingly, you, Hebrews is not talking about the church anymore. It's talking about the Hebrews. James talks about Hebrew issues as he discusses faith. First and Second Peter talk about holiness. And who's he writing to? He's writing to the Hebrews. First, second, and third John talk about fellowship in the Spirit and the coming of the Antichrist. Jude talks about false teachers, the Antichrist. Revelation talks about what? The coming of the Antichrist and Christ. And so Hebrews through Revelation are a concluding series of books. You have three groups of nine books, 27 books. Which, by the way, is the number of the complete Hebrew alphabet, including the five Sophit letters, 27 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. I'm saying that there are no accidents or mistakes where the Bible is concerned. Structurally, it's perfect. And in that structure, now we're beginning the last nine books of the Bible with Hebrews. And we're talking about the wilderness journey and people falling in the wilderness. And the writer to the Hebrews is using this as an example to, the, to his contemporaries as he writes this letter saying, you don't want to be like them. You want to go on. He said they couldn't enter into the promised land because of unbelief. I want you to believe in the deity of Christ and his superiority to the Mosaic Levitical system. Chapter 4, where we will begin today, <clears throat> is a, a fascinating chapter, and it's a challenge. And in fact, this whole book is a challenge, but by now the writer has gotten down to business. Chapter 4, let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Again, he's writing to the Hebrews, and he's saying, <clears throat> let us fear. Let us fear, because we don't want to fall short of the promise that was made, as did the children of Israel in the desert. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. They were not united in faith. And by the way, the children of Israel in the desert received, and this and Hebrews gets to this as you go on past 9, 10, and 11 in Hebrews, it gets to the subject of mediation. Faith is, is the product of mediation. It has to be mediated by somebody. If somebody comes to you with an offer, I'm going to give you salvation, and it's yours to take or not to take, it's your choice. The person who comes with, with that is a mediator. 
In the case of the law, the mediators were angels and Moses. In the case of the church, the mediator was Christ, who came in person, and then he sent his apostles, who acted in his behalf, and they were mediators. In a sense, when we offer the gospel message to anyone, we are acting as mediators. And that idea is very, very big in Hebrews. And he says, let's fear, lest a promise being left, of us, uh, left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Now, I want, to, want you to focus on the word rest. And it is, in the Greek, a, a common term for pausing, taking a breath, and just being quiet. Rest. There are several Greek words for rest, but the word used here is katapausis, which just means take a deep breath, pause, and rest. And the rest, that is resting in the Lord, was something that the children of Israel never learned to do, ever. It's something that is very difficult to do. The apostles were all preoccupied with the idea of entering into the rest of Christ, the rest and the peace. Put it, put it through all, putting all your cares on Him and achieving a spiritually um, stable uh, status. And so the writer to the Hebrews is now saying, okay, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about rest here. Verse 2, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being uh, mixed with or united by faith in them that heard it. Uh, for we which have believed do enter into rest. That's the second rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. That's Psalm 95, which we looked at last week. Psalm 95 is the psalm of it's written to Issachar, and, and Issachar has the, the reputation of being a deeply engaged student of the Bible. Uh, Issach, Issachar was the, the, the tribe that, that God blessed for being great students of his word. Psalm 95 is a psalm of Issachar. And, and it deals here with rest. So we now have three. Uh, occasions of the word rest, as I have sworn in my wrath that they shall enter into my rest, although the, uh, the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. That's Genesis 2, chapter 2. Now, that's the fourth occasion in which we have seen the word rest. <clears throat> and in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. That's Psalm 95. Quote it again. He quotes Psalm 95, 11 twice. It's very rare to see a, a verse of Scripture quoted twice within two or three verses, but he does. This must be important. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief, and he's talking about the children of Israel here. Again, he limiteth, limiteth a certain day, saying, In David today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Again, that's Psalm 95, verse 7, which now has been quoted twice here in two chapters of Hebrews. And all of this is written in, in a very fine Greek. Uh, if, you, if you are a student of the Greek, and, and I'm not a, 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 a Greek academician by any means, but I like to read the, the words of the academicians, and they all marvel about the book of Hebrews. Uh, of what incredibly wonderful Greek it's written in. It's written in oratorical Greek called Hellenikotera. It's absolutely gorgeous, beautiful language to listen to if you hear it read by someone who knows how to read Greek. And it's written 
quoting the Septuagint Greek Old Testament so that everything about Hebrews is Greek. It was written in Hellenic Kotera to the priesthood and it quotes the Greek Septuagint Bible. It's very important because Greek, uh, Hebrew academics in the first century were exclusively Greek scholars, but you didn't know that, did you? But they were. And the Septuagint is quoted time and time and time and time and time and time again in this book. Not the Tanakh, not the, the, the Hebrew scrolls, but the Septuagint is quoted, which seems odd to us. But, but, but the writer to the Hebrews is making his point. Now, Paul, I am absolutely convinced that many people think Paul wrote Hebrews. The church fathers and others were not convinced about the authorship of Hebrews. But Paul was a Hebrew scholar and a Greek scholar, and he had the equivalent of two PhDs. He attended the University of Taurus, uh, uh, Tarsus, and I am absolutely certain that there he st studied academic Greek, that is Hellenic Otera. So he could well have written this. Uh, it was the language that he used to see in his travels and everywhere he went. Uh, he would be speaking probably a, quite a flawless uh, Greek. Today, <clears throat> after so long a time as it is said, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, that's Psalm 95, 7. Verse 8, for if Jesus had given them rest, now that's the sixth time the word rest has occurred in this chapter. For if Jesus had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Whoa, wait a minute, what's the other day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. It's kind of fascinating in Greek, in verse 8, it says, if Yehoshua had given them rest. The name of Joshua. And most scholars say this is speaking not of Jesus, but Yehoshua and Yeshua are essentially the same name. And here in the text, the King James writers have taken Yehoshua and turned it to Jesus when in fact it's referring to Joshua. For if Joshua had given them rest, that's the sixth occurrence of rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? In other words, Joshua didn't give the children of Israel rest and we all have heard the sermon of Joshua where he tells the children of Israel at the end of the book of Joshua, look folks, here's what you have to do. And, and, and rest and peace is coming, but it's not here yet, said Joshua. That's the way you know, his, 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 uh, his book ends. There remaineth therefore a rest, that's the seventh occurrence, to the people of God. In Hellenic Otera, katapausis is the word for rest. But here in the seventh occurrence of the word rest, it is not katapausis, it's sabbatismos. And all of you know enough Greek to know what sabbatismos is, right? It's the Sabbath. And so the reference in verse 9 is to the Sabbath. <clears throat> there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God, a Sabbath. And there does remain a Sabbath. Uh, we believe in the millennium. We believe that Jesus Christ is coming back in the seventh millennium and his feet will touch down on the Mount of Olives and he's going to do what has to be done. And he's going to uh, create all the conditions for a thousand year kingdom. And he's going to rebuild the temple. We all understand that. And that seventh thousand year period is what is being referred to as sabbatismos here. <clears throat> there remaineth therefore a rest for the people of God. Israel is still waiting for the rest. They are looking for rest and peace. For he that is entered into his rest 
And again, this is the word catapausis, a, a rest, meaning just take a deep breath and relax. He also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore. Let us endeavor to enter into that rest. And that's the ninth occurrence of the word rest in this chapter. Lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit, of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It is, it is, a, it is, a, it is able, the word of God is able to make very small and uh, critical points concerning the thoughts and intents of the heart. It, it, the Word of God is a knife edge. There's a metaphor in Revelation where Jesus comes back on a white horse and out of his mouth goes the Word of God and it looks like a sword cutting to and fro. His words actually have substance. They, they, they cut literally. <clears throat> and that's what's being spoken of here. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Verse 14, and this is a Hebrew writing to the Hebrews. <clears throat> and that's why I, I think it must be Paul, although I'm not going to be dogmatic about that. Seeing then that we, that's a Hebrew writing to the Hebrews, seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted uh, like as we are, yet without sin. And here he's offering the superiority of the priesthood of Christ over any human priesthood. The fact is that our priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, was touched with every kind of difficulty that it's possible to conceive of. <clears throat> and he bore our sins. And none of the Aaronic priesthood could say that. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, the writer to the Hebrews is, at this point, speaking to those who have only given intellectual assent to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this becomes clearer and clearer and clearer as you read this, this book. To those who have given intellectual assent, yes, Je this Jesus came. Yes, he, he fulfilled all the prophecies. He was killed on Passover, etc. All these things they knew about him. Uh, the apostles taught all this. And by, this is being written in 68 AD, which is 38 years after the crucifixion of Christ. So by this time, everybody had had a chance to hear what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Paul were talking about. They knew, and they were giving intellectual assent to the fact that Jesus died. Uh, he, he was sent from the Father. He died for our sins. But it was only intellectual ascent. They still had every day, uh, six times a day, the trumpet blew from the place of the trumpeting at the top of the temple. The priests had their priestly ablutions, the mikvahot, the marches, the changes of of priestly orders, the, the sacrifices, the smoke going up, everything happening in Jerusalem. All the feasts being kept, the pilgrimages, everything is still going on. What would you, what would you uh, do? You're a Jew in that day and, and, and the temple is in full function and you believe in Jesus. You believe in what Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John have been, have been saying. 
And yet, mm, I'm going to go, I have to, I have to give myself to temple worship. I just have to. It's still there. I can't quit. I've got to go. Because my dad went, and his dad, and we just got to do it. And in a sense, you're depending upon a human priest. In chapter 4, the word rest occurs nine times. Nine in the Bible is the number of finality in divine things. If you study the number nine in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you'll discover when you have a grouping of nine things, they are all that God wants to say about that particular subject at that time. For example, when Jesus stood up and, and gave the, the Beatitudes, he said, blessed is the, or blessed are the, you, remember, you know how many Beatitudes there are? Yeah, well, nine. Corresponding to the fruit of the Spirit uh, in, in Galatians chapter 5. You know how many uh, fruit there are in the grouping of the fruit of the Spirit? Nine. <clears throat> New Testament is divided into three nines. First nine, uh, the Gospels and history. Second nine, the church. The last nine, dealing with uh, the culmination of all things. Nine, nine, nine. Not six, six, six. Gifts of the Spirit given in 1 Corinthians 12. Do you remember how many gifts of the Spirit there are in 1 Corinthians 12? Make a wild guess. Nine. Melchizedek is mentioned here. And we're going to be getting into that in chapter 6 and 7 of Hebrews. Melchizedek is mentioned how many times? Nine times. And that's all. Just nine. Period. And how many times does the word rest occur in Hebrews? Nine times. And only in chapter 4. The word rest is not used anywhere else, either as katapausis or sabbatismos. And I don't even have to mention all these things. But these are just side issues. But to me, if you know these things, it helps you to understand that Scripture is divinely ordained. It is written on a level that we humans can barely understand. And I put myself at the head of that list, by the way. Because the more you study the Bible, the less you know. <laughs> there are days when you just fall down and say, okay, God, <laughs> I have been censured. I thought I knew something. And once again, you have proven to me that I don't. But I keep on studying anyway. Chapter 5. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for man in things pertaining to God, that he may both that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. <clears throat> now he's speaking of the Levitical priesthood here, the Aaronic priesthood for every high priest taken from among men. And by the way, it was only one tribe among the twelve that could serve as priests. It had to come from the tribe of Levi and it was an ironically ordained priesthood. That he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, have gone in a wayward direction, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity, surrounded by weakness. And by reason hereof, he ought, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. <clears throat> so essentially now he is arguing uh, the superior, uh, superiority of Christ's priesthood over the Aaronic priesthood. 
you know, you tend not to think of, of Jesus as priest, but he is. Uh, you tend to think of him as your savior, brother, friend. We are family members. We, we have been adopted through Christ. But he's also our high priest who makes intercession for us via his Holy Spirit. Likewise, the Spirit helpeth our infirmities, it says in Romans chapter 8. This is sanctification. For we know not what we should pray uh, for as we ought, but the Spirit uh, himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So, so the Lord Jesus Christ, by his Spirit, makes intercession for us. And it's a really, really good thing because though I am saved, I am a sinner. That is, I retain my sin nature. And I, believe me, I need constant intercession because I know what goes on inside of me and it ain't pretty. I need intercession. We all need intercession and he does. He's our high priest. Romans 8, 27, He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. He is our priest. Romans 8, 34, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, that is risen again, who uh, is even at the right hand of God, who also, make, also maketh intercession for us. Here Christ is said to be at the right hand of God, making intercession for us. Twice in Romans it says that the Spirit makes intercession for us, but it also says Christ makes intercession for us. But we have to keep that in mind, and here in chapter 5 of Hebrews, the writer is going on to make the argument that our intercessor is superior to the Levitical intercessor. Well, sure, we all know that. I mean, we are... Uh, blood-bought, born-again Christians, and we know these things. We study the Word. But it's fascinating to, to see the argument being made. And you, we're, we're listening in on a conversation between a, well, who, who is this? Between, I was going to say between a man on the street who is very intelligent, unknown person, talking to a uh, member of the Aaronic priesthood and making the argument that the, the priesthood of Christ is superior. And the, and the guy, the Levite, is going to stand there and he's going to, I don't believe so, I don't think you're right. And you know how Jesus went around and around with these guys, <coughs> and Paul and all the others, and believe me, never argue with a, a high rabbi, you, you're, you're going to lose every single time. And he's going to be arguing for the Aaronic priesthood. Well, this, so we're getting to listen in on this conversation between, I believe, an apostle and a priest. And the apostle says the priesthood of Christ is superior to your priesthood. No man takes this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God. In other words, the intercessory priesthood is not something that you elect yourself into. It, it, it's just not like that at all. You have to be called. And the conditions of the calling are very specific. So, also, Christ glorified not himself, uh, to be made a high priest. But he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. Christ did not elect himself to the priesthood. That's interesting. Jesus did not say, You know what? I'm going to be priest, a high priest. He didn't. What did he do? He, he did what he had to do, and the Father glorified the Son. 
and elected him to the priesthood. Jesus rose. He's, he's in heaven today. He is our great high priest. When you read the book of Revelation, everything you see Jesus doing is in the role of high priest. He is our high priest. He is the high priest of the planet. And that's his role ever since he rose from the dead. He did not glorify himself. Quite the opposite. He was literally forsaken of the Father at the cross. And the Father was well pleased in the Son, and the Father elected him to be priest. And this is the argument here for the Melchizedekian priesthood. Verse 6, as he saith also in another place, this is Psalm 110, verse 4, Thou art a priest forever after the order of, of Melchizedek. <clears throat> this is the first of nine places that the name Melchizedek is mentioned in Hebrew, Hebrews. Melchizedek is a Hebrew for uh, king of righteousness. He's the king of righteousness who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Jesus learned obedience by the things which he suffered. That is a staggering thought. That's staggering. Do you and I learn obedience by the things which we suffer? You better believe it. We do. And at the same time, we pray, Lord, please remove this suffering from me. Right. So this is an interesting conversation between this apostle and this priest and this argument about the superiority of of Christ. <clears throat> and being made perfect, verse 9, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Do you get this in verse 10? Jesus was called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Not the order of Aaron and the Levites, but the order of Melchizedek. And then the next sentence is really interesting because it, it, this makes it really sound like you're listening in on a conversation. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing that you're dull of hearing. This is like, okay, do you insult your audience? Well, <laughs> here you are insulting your, your audience. You're saying, hey, I'd like to say a lot of stuff about Melchizedek, but <clears throat> they're hard to say. And furthermore, you're dull of hearing. For when, for the time you ought to be teachers, who's he talking to here? The Hebrews of 68 AD. He says, for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. What are the first principles of the oracles of God? If, if you think about it a while, you'll, you will understand that the first principles of the oracles of God are found in the gospel of grace. The gospel of grace. The whole Bible speaks of grace from one end to the other. The whole Bible does not speak of law. It speaks of grace. <clears throat> from Adam and Eve to, to the new heavens and the new earth, it's grace, 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 all the way through. And, and here the, the protagonist is, is, uh, is saying, it's necessary for me to go back to square one to teach you the first principles of the oracles of God. And, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. We're going to have to go back to square one with you people. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, 
for he's a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. It's called training, discipline, to have your, your senses trained to discern both good and evil. Strong meat belongeth to those who are of full age, people who study, as Paul said, study to show themselves approved, people who really look into the fine elements of the Word of God and try to understand what it is saying. <clears throat> Now we haven't finished the nine yet, the nine mentions of Melchizedek, and we're just barely, in, fact, in my opinion, we haven't even started yet. I'm just getting warmed up. Chapter six, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, and we, we come back now to chapter six for the third time. This will be the third time we have looked at chapter six, which is one of those chapters, this is one of those places in the Bible you have to revisit time and time and time again. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, that is the elementary principles, the first principles of the doctrine of Christ, what is the, one of the first principles of the doctrine of Christ? It is Jesus is coming to set up the kingdom. Well, no, let's go back. Let's go back. Not Jesus, Messiah is coming to set up the kingdom. <clears throat> what will his name be? Well, Rabbi Kaduri said it would be Yehoshua. In the old days, you know, they didn't know what his name was going to be, even though his name is written all through the Old Testament. The book of Habakkuk even has the name Jesus written uh, within it with the word salvation. Two words right together. So we're leaving the elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ. We're not talking about what the Jews talked about, which is Messiah is coming one of these days to set up the kingdom. They didn't know what his name was going to be. And that's, that's what's being spoken of here. But now it's A.D. 68 and everybody knows what his name is. Even many of those in the, in the temple. Exercising all of the privileges and responsibilities necessary to maintain uh, the Aaronic priesthood. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. It's not all about repentance. Repentance is very, very big in Judaism in those days. From the building of the first temple, second temple, period, repentance uh, from dead works is a very, very big part of Judaism. It's part of keeping the festivals, the feasts, the uh, uh, aspects of study and the aspects of self-purification. Uh, repentance from dead works, faith toward God, what would faith toward God be in this context? It would be the belief that God is going to send us a Messiah figure. And the writer says it's time to go on beyond that because he's already come. He came 38 years ago and entered into the heavens where he is functioning today as our high priest. And of the doctrine of baptisms, uh, that would be the, the numerous baptisms that were uh, followed in uh, first century Judaism. There were mikvaot everywhere, baptismals, full body baptismals, baptismals for the hands, baptismals for the feet. Uh, and every time you baptize your hands, you would say uh, a 
uh, a prayer of some sort. Every time you, you baptized your feet, you would say a prayer. Every time you took a full body baptism, you would sit, come up and say various kinds of prayers. And this is the doctrine of baptism. I'm telling you, the Jews really knew how to baptize in the first century. <clears throat> Did it many times a day. And this writer says it's time to leave that doctrine. Doctrine of laying on of hands. The laying on of hands is for the conference of uh, a certain responsibility or uh, position. The resurrection of the dead, well, why not talk about the resurrection of the dead? Well, we do, but, but not like this. The resurrection of the dead, uh, as taught in the temple, was that someday the dead are going to be resurrected. And the kingdom will be brought in. But from the perspective of the writer to the Hebrews, it's time to quit believing that because Jesus has already been resurrected and with him, uh, many of the Old Testament saints who were taken to heaven in a great triumphal parade, uh, as we find in Colossians. It's time, says the writer to the Hebrews, to leave that stuff behind. Let's go on uh, to, and talk about some various things and of eternal judgment. Of course, eternal judgment is the uh, inscription in the book of life or lack thereof. <clears throat> The Jews had a whole very, very large body of, uh, of belief that was dedicated to understanding uh, one's disposition as regards internal, eternal judgment. This we will do if God permit. If I want to go on from the elementary principles, and I want to talk to you about today, right now, is what he's saying. I want to talk to you about right now in 68 A.D. Do you understand what happened 38 years ago? For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again to repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. And essentially what he's saying here is if someone in your condition with one foot in the Aaronic priesthood and the other foot in the priesthood of Christ vacillating between the two if you wobble over toward the priesthood of uh, Levi he says it's impossible to pull you back. You've, you've had the opportunity you have seen all that you needed to see to make the decision for Christ, and you haven't done it. And it's going to be, if you tilt the wrong way, it's going to be impossible to pull you back because you have been a partaker of the Holy Ghost. And again, that word is metakos. It, what he's saying here is that you, ha you haven't been saved or indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You have been a partaker, a partner. You have you have participated in the power of the Spirit of God. <clears throat> and again, he's speaking to, to those Hebrews who have given intellectual assent and that only to the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and all of the attributes that that brought. He say, you, you were a partaker with the Holy Ghost. You are a partaker, but you, you have not yet been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You have not yet been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine somebody in that condition? I've seen people in that condition who ultimately decided that they did not want salvation. I've seen people who many of whom, some of whom I knew for 30 years, who claimed to be Christians. And at, at the end of their life, uh, uh, they had fallen away completely. They no, no longer claimed to be or wanted to be Christians. They had been partakers of Christ. They had been churchgoers. They had been, from time to time, warmed up about you know, going and singing hymns and putting money in the collection box, but then they fell away and 
in one case I'm thinking in particular, went into drugs and alcohol, and, and at the end of their life they were lost. They had been partakers, but they never gave their life to Jesus, and they were never baptized in the Spirit of God. They were metacos, business partners, but they were not family. Well, it's interesting to listen in on this argument. It really is, because for me, it wakes you up a little bit, makes you think, You're like, who am I? Wow, where do I fit into all this? Impossible, if they shall fall away, to renew them again to repentance. See, they crucified in themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs, that is, veggies, suitable for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. This is the first, we're going to stop here today, this is the first hint we find in Hebrews of the fate of the temple of Herod. It is to be burned. A scant two years after the writing of this epistle, the whole priesthood was burnt. Priests were beheaded. They were put to the sword. They were killed. They were imprisoned. They were enslaved. Everything they had was stolen from them. The Romans ripped the temple apart, threw it to the ground. The whole thing was burned. And verses 7 and 8, I believe, are a prediction of just that priesthood was operating, doing that which they thought was the right thing to do. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing. Do you notice the wording there? It's near. It's not there yet, but the curse is getting near. And the way I read this, this is a couple of years before the burning of the temple. That which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and it is very near unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. Wow. That'll make you stop and think. It's sad that it has to happen. When I read about what happened to the Jews and all the persecutions and pogroms and, and all of the alienations and judgments that they've had to bear, it makes you want to cry. But it's within the plan of God. And we're standing here blessed beyond belief as we read these words and as we understand what is being said and the implications. Talk about count your blessings. I am counting my blessings as I read these words because I am safe in Christ. And He is interceding for me on a level that I can't even conceive of. Verse 9, which we'll start out on next week. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. So that's the issue, salvation. This is just getting interesting. I hate to stop right here. <laughs> that's called tease and break in the radio business. <laughs> But I'm serious. I'm just going to have to go home and finish reading the rest of this chapter today. No, I have already. I've actually read the book. And it's amazing. 